Welcome to Science with Soul. I'm Dr. Laurie Valentine and the host of this program. I'm a physician, evidential psychic medium, international keynote speaker, and the author of Med School After Menopause, The Journey of My Soul. This podcast was inspired by events from my own life. And as I have journeyed through life, it has taught me that we're part of a greater divine web of interconnectedness. I have walked the path of illness, healing, and transformation. And after experiencing two near-death experiences, I became clairvoyant, clairaudient, and clairsentient, and I was guided to attend medical school at the age of 54. In this podcast, we will meet many different types of doctors, healers, spiritual leaders, educators, and other interesting souls. And it is my hope that you will gain information from this podcast to help create a path of healing your own life physically, emotionally, and spiritually, and bridge the gap between science and soul. Hi everyone, I'm Dr. Lottie, and I'm really honored to be here and share this special day with you. I'm going to be talking about intuition and spirituality in modern healthcare. When we look at medicine in the Western world, we tend to look at each organ separately, and we're taught to give a medication for that symptom to suppress the symptoms so that the patient will feel better. But we don't really heal the person. We tend to just give a medication and then that person moves on with his or her life. Um, We need to change the way we look at a person. We need to incorporate a more holistic approach in the healing of that person. And when you look at the world, Everything is connected. We are connected to everything that is. Our bodies don't just communicate using chemical signals or chemical reactions, but we also use energy and electricity to communicate within our own body as well as other organisms. We were born from a web of life connecting us physically to all that is and spiritually, even our ancestors. And we carry that behavioral or trauma pattern uh, either from our DNA or from the invisible grid of the interconnectedness of all that is. And they've even proved now that like trauma events gets passed down through the physical DNA. And so if your grandfather experienced a trauma, you might actually carry that trauma within you because they know it gets passed down via the DNA. So this is just the beginning of looking at how interconnected we are. You don't even have to know about that trauma and still experience that trauma. And there was an article published in the Biological Psychiatry Psychiatry Journal titled titled Holocaust Exposure Induced Intergenerational Effects on the FKBP5 Methylation Gene. And they proved that trauma actually gets passed down. So when you think about that, that we can even prove it with the DNA now, think about all the interconnectedness we also have spiritually through the invisible grid. So let me tell you a story about my own journey and how I came about to being so interested in the interconnectedness of all that is. So I had two near-death experiences, one in 1992 and one in 1994. And I was raised Lutheran in Scandinavia in Sweden, which is uh, one of the countries in Europe. It's all the way up north underneath the North Pole. And I did not believe in anything. If I thought that when you die, that's it, everything is black and you're gone. And if you could not touch it, smell it, hear it, feel it, as far as I was concerned, it did not exist. So this is how I went into my first near-death experience. So you can imagine that I was, I was in for a surprise. So my first near-death experience happened after my third child was born. And 
we took off for the hospital. And then, of course, um, I was in labor, contracting three minutes apart. I'm on the table and a 7.4 earthquake hits. And this is one of the moments in my life when I thought I was going to die. Is when you know life flashes before your eyes and you're like, oh my gosh, I didn't think my life was going to end this way. And so that's how she came into the world. And literally the nurses and my husband were, were leaning over me on the birthing table just so I wouldn't fly off. And the hospital was built on rollers. So the whole hospital was moving back and forth. And there were these gigantic windows from floor to ceiling. And I figured this is it. Either the, the windows are going to cave in or the ceiling tiles are going to fall in on us. And my labor actually stopped. It was that bad. I, I thought I was going to die. Uh, anyway, the, the earthquake stopped. And 30 minutes later, my daughter was born. And after she was born, they, you know, they clean her up and they put her on my chest. And at this point, I have this severe pain in my stomach and I just kind of lean backwards and I yell for my husband, take the baby, take the baby. I could not hold her anymore because the, the pain was so severe. And the nurses came in and they massaged my uterus and this mountain of blood clots came out and they keep me an extra day in the hospital. And I'm on this drip to contract the uterus back down. And after two days, they said, well, she seems fine. We're going to send you on your way. And then 10 days later, when my friends were holding a birth um, a baby shower for me in the park, I go to the restroom and this enormous blood clot, the size of a baby's head, comes out and falls into the toilet. And I look at that blood clot and, you know, it's like when you feel nauseous because you know something is really wrong and just seeing that much blood come out of your body is, is just shocking in itself. So I went home and my husband took me to the emergency room and they keep me for observation They do a manual examination. And they say, well, not much blood is coming out right now. And they send me on my way. And then the next day in the evening, I, I go to use the restroom at, in our house. And the same thing happens. Another huge blood clot comes out. And I yell for my parents who were visiting to help with the, the kids and my husband and we call the ER and we say, hey, another blood clot came out, what should we do? And because the bleeding stopped on itself, we decided I should just see the doctor the next morning. So I go to the doctor the next day. He does the same thing, a manual examination. There's not much blood coming out right now. And I get sent on my way. No blood work, no ultrasound, nothing. And then the next day I go to use the restroom again another large blood clot comes out. So we decide, well, let's go back to the ER. And it's a good thing we did because if we hadn't, I probably wouldn't be here right now. So we go back to the ER and they examine me and they say, well, you know, there's not much happening right now. And they leave me, you know, for observation. They close the door, no bell to ring. And I just lie there and wait. And then eventually I started bleeding again. And I'm thinking, wow, this is great. I'm bleeding again. They're finally gonna figure out that something is wrong. So the door is closed and finally a nurse opens the door and her jaw just drops and she says, oh, and she, I can hear the call going through the loudspeakers, OBGYN, stat to the ER. And I'm just lying there thinking, well, this is good because they finally figured out something is wrong. So this elderly gentleman, probably in his 50s or 60s, comes jogging in with a young physician behind him. And they examine me. And as they examine me, another large blood clot comes out. And at this point, I tried to sit up to tell him that I'm not feeling too good. And he knew right away, as soon as I said, I don't feel too good, he just pushed me down on the bed and they started tipping it. So my head would go down and my feet would go up and to keep you know, the, the blood in the vital organs. 
And I have a nurse on my right and a nurse on my left. Now the nurse on my right is quoting my blood pressure and the nurse on my left is trying to place an IV. And I just feel like I'm falling. So imagine like jumping out of an airplane without a parachute or being on an elevator and just plummeting through the shaft. It's that kind of feeling. I'm just like, it's a free fall feeling. I'm just falling. And the nurse on my right yells out my blood pressure. And she says, 50 over 15, hurry. And it's at that moment that I realize very shortly after that moment, I realize that I'm dying. I now know that I'm dying, which is very different from the experience with the earthquake where I thought I was going to die. This is a complete knowledge of the fact that I was dying. And so what do I do? The atheist that I am, I pray to God to save my life. So I I'm, I'm fall, it feels like I'm on free fall and I plead to God, I'm holding on for my life. And I say, I have three children under the age of six, please let me live. They need a mother. And with that, I, I, I'm just like holding on, like you're, you're hanging on a cliff with just your nails. That's what it feels like. But I can feel the pull on my soul. And it's shortly after that, I just get weaker and weaker and weaker. And I, I'm holding on. I'm trying to hold on to my soul. Like, don't leave because I can feel it separating, even though I didn't even believe in that there was such a thing as a soul, right? So I'm a complete atheist. But I still know that that is what's happening. But then it's one second I'm in my body, and the next second I'm outside because that separation just happens in a split second and so all of a sudden I'm just outside but the interesting part of this is that I now find myself outside my body but I know I am still me so I can still think I can still I'm still aware of everything I'm just outside my body I'm still me how can this be how can I still be me and outside my body? This is not supposed to happen. And that's what I'm thinking. But when I'm outside my body, there is also this knowledge that there is no time on the other side. It is as if I have access to everything that ever was and will be. There is no past, present, and future. Time only exists on this side. That's how we perceive our life here on earth that we live on this timeline. But on the other side, there was no time. But there's also this unconditional peace that I felt there was just peace on the other side, calm and peace. And this you know, feeling of unconditional love that I didn't really understand what it was because the impression was more of peace and calmness at that point. And then I'm just sucked back into my body as quickly as I was pulled out. And it's just a split second. And it's just like a, a giant vacuum cleaner just sucking you back in. And it's just like that. And I'm just sucked back in. But the thing is, for some reason, everything makes perfect sense on the other side. And then you go back into your body and you're back in the earth plane. There is a knowing that everything on the other side is very divine. Our whole existence is very divine. And it's as if you're in in-between state. You're not in heaven. You're not on earth. But there, it was like some space that I was in that was in between the two worlds. But then what happened is that... I get really sick for the next nine months. It's such a long story and I'm trying to make it short for you, but I was really sick. And I basically sat in a rocking chair for nine months to a year. And I ended up with what's called idiopathic aplastic anemia. So you have a suppression of your bone marrow. You don't have enough white blood cells, red blood cells, or platelets. So you have poor immune system. You get sick all the time. You're anemic. So you get exhausted because you're not moving enough oxygen. 
and you have low platelets, so you bruise easily. See, I had this huge bruise on my, that spanned my entire hip from bumping into the baby's changing table. It should have given me a, a bruise about the size of my pinky nail, but no, it's it covered my entire hip. So I'm really sick and I have this problem, constant problem. I have electrical interference and all this other fun things. My watches all stop. My televisions would turn on when I walk by and it's, it just becomes very messy. And uh, during this whole time, it took a long time. It took me 12 years to actually get really well, but it took me six years to heal out of this bone marrow suppression. So I had a stool in the kitchen for the next six years because I could not stand up long enough to cook dinner for my children. And there was a clear division of my body and my soul. And it was as if my soul had emerged back in with my body. So if you think of laying a, a puzzle, you know, the last piece of the puzzle and, the, and one piece is sticking up and you kind of have to pat it down to make it be flat with the rest of the puzzle. It's kind of like that. So the, the soul felt like it was emerged back in. I wasn't one. I wasn't one. My soul and body were not together. They were separate. And I struggled with this for years. Um, and it's because I walked such a fine line. It was like I was half dead, you know, and, and also my soul probably did emerge all the way back in and, and I was really sick. So it's kind of a double whammy, but I struggled. So I try to keep my soul constantly, you know, 10 times a day, I'd be tying the sh my kids shoes and I'd be saying, please don't let me, please let me stay. Please let me stay, you know, trying to hold on to my soul. So I wouldn't just pop out. And this was my, this was my existence. So then in 1994, so it's two years later, I wake up in the middle of the night and this is something that happened a lot. And I would just take my head off the pillow and try to lie flat and get more blood to my head. And I would just feel like, you know, really struggle to hold my soul back and say, you know, we got to stay in this body. The kids need a mom. And that this one evening, the pull was just too strong. And again, it just, my soul just popped out. Like in a split second, I'm just out. And this was very different. It was a very different experience because it was as if I was just tumbling through darkness. Um, you probably have heard of going through the tunnel and seeing the light at the end of the tunnel. That actually is not the norm of a near-death experience. It's usually um, something very different, just popping out of the body or tumbling through darkness or everybody has very different experiences. But it was as if I was tumbling through darkness and then I arrive at what I call the mid-station. And I call it the mid station because I was aware that there were levels below me, but there were also levels above me. But when I get to this place, I hear the most beautiful music. And I'm wondering, where is this music coming from? And it is more beautiful than any music you've ever heard in the earth plane because you can't make the sound on the earth plane. And I look around and I see an, a log cabin of all things. And I often think that we, the things we see or experience, you know, maybe it's, they show us things that would be comforting to us. I'm not really sure because it just sounds funny to me that I saw a log cabin. Anyway, I look to my right and I see this log cabin. And so I open the door because I'm thinking maybe the music is coming from inside this log cabin. So I open the door, I look inside there, there's nothing there. It's just empty. And I'm really surprised. So I look to my left and I say, wow, there's another log cabin. And it looks the same as the one to my right, just like a mirror image. So I open the door and I look inside and it's empty. But at this point, I become aware of a, a really bright white light, but it's coming from behind me. So it's like, I don't have a body because I'm just in spirit form. So I turn around in spirit form and I see this beautiful, bright, white light. And this bright, white light is brighter than anything that you can imagine. Um, I've often tried to find the images on the internet to see if I can find something that even resembles it. But imagine the brightest, whitest light you've ever seen. 
And I, I'm aware that the music is coming from the light. But when I look at the light, there is an outline of angels in the light. And the music is coming from the angels. Now, I did not believe in angels, but still, that is what I'm seeing. So as I'm looking at this light and listening to the most beautiful music, there is also this awareness of this light because the light is just pure, unconditional love. And this, you, it's like I become part of the light. I know that I am the light. I come from the light. I carry that light within me and I will return to that light. And the light is just pure, unconditional love. As I'm being enveloped by this light, and it's just a feeling that it is just so magnificent that you wouldn't ever want to leave it. I become aware of a spirit guide on to my right and another spirit guide diagonally to my left. The spirit guide on my right communicates with the other spirit guide to diagonally to the left in front of me. And he says, what is she doing here? She can't be here. She has to go back. And I say, no, no, no. Wait a second. How can this be? How can it be outside my body and still be me? And the spirit guide on my left says, if I told you, you won't remember but you will remember this. And it is as if they can control what we remember. And I've heard other stories now lately that confirms that, that there is a, some way that they can control what we actually remember. But with that, all of a sudden, it's like an image just appear. And it is as if I'm standing on the moon, looking down on the earth. But around the earth, there is the silvery, glittery, glittery net. And it, to me, it looks like a fish net because I grew up in Sweden and I would row that boat early in the morning for my grandmother and she would lay fish nets in the ocean and catch fish for all of us to eat. And when she pulled that fish net out of the ocean early in the morning, the sun would glitter on those, the water droplets would glitter on the fish net. And so me, looking down and seeing the earth, to me, it looked like a glittery fishnet surrounding the earth. And the spirit guide says, everything on earth is connected up to this grid, but everything on earth is connected to each other. And it's with that message that I was sent back to earth. And it's this message, which happened 26 years ago. It has taken me a quarter of a century to put it all together and really understand the depth of the meaning of that message and how we are truly connected to each other. And again, up into the universe and the spirit world. We are all connected. And I'm going to talk a little bit more about that in a minute. So these types of experiences actually changes a person, both psychologically and physiologically. And I experienced a lot of electrical interference. My watch has stopped. My television would turn on. And I talk a lot about these different things in my book. And the people who have these kind of experience actually change so much that sometimes the family members don't recognize the person. And the divorce rate for people who have experienced an NDE is somewhere between 70 and 80%. Because the person that married the person that had an NDE no longer recognizes that person. They changed so much from that experience. So some of the things that happened to me is that I became clairvoyant, clairaudient, and clairsentient. 
And I'm going to tell you some stories about that. So I started seeing things and hearing things before they would happen. And it would be a warning of some kind. Somebody would be sick. Somebody's going to die. It could be almost anything. And uh, one morning, I'm shown three successive slides. The first slide is of a black scratch across the passenger side of the van door. We had a van at the time because our kids were, were young. And the second image, I see two children in the car. One is in the front seat and one is in the back seat. And the third image, I'm leaving a note on a black sedan car. And I told my children and I said, wow, this is what I saw. And the only way we could get hit is if we turn left and we have oncoming traffic from the right. So we went through all the different intersections and figured out one particular intersection where it was most likely that we would get hit. So every day I'm driving my kids to school in San Francisco. We get to this particular intersection. My kids are looking at the window and they say, mom, the coast is clear, you can go. And this goes on for about you know, 10 days to two weeks. And then we are in our little town and we come out of the bookstore in the car and there is a lot of cars trying to get in and there's a big truck offloading boxes of books for the bookstore. And I try to squeeze out onto this little narrow street and I'm making a right hand turn. And as I make a right hand turn onto the street, the right hand side of my car scrapes the car that is parked and it's a black sedan car. So as this happens, I of course know that what I'm going to see. So I step out of my car, I walk around and I see this black scratch on my car and I just lose it. I just laugh so hard. And everybody's just staring at me because they think, oh my gosh, this woman is nuts. She just scraped this car and she's just standing there laughing. So of course I end up leaving a note on the black sedan car on the windshield because there was no driver. So that is just one example of what happened and how I became clairvoyant. So after 12 years of, of these kind of events, um, I was in my living room and I'm walking to the kitchen and I'm aware of a spirit guide coming in and he gives me four messages. And he says, one, you have to become a naturopathic doctor. Two, you are to integrate East and West. You will bring messages and healing to the people and you will write two books, no wait, three. And that message was so clear and so strong. I was enrolled in my prereq classes for med school within a week. Because at this point, after 12 years of having heard messages and you know, getting it confirmed over and over and over again, I just, now when I got a message like that, I knew this is it, I have to do it. And it's just this knowing that you have within, you know, within you that this is the right thing. And I was really confused about the messages because I said, what do you mean bringing messages to people or healing to the people? What do you mean about writing books? I don't, I've never thought of myself as an author. Anyway, that message about the books, you are to write two books, no wait, three. I've gotten that message myself four times. So two times from mediums in the United States and two times in England from mediums there. And I only had an outline of the book at this time. Nobody knew I was going to write a book except for me. And the message is always the same. I have your mom with me. She's telling me you started writing a book. She says you were to write two books. No, wait, three. And that message comes through over and over again. So our existence, how divine is that? So after I graduated, I went to medical school. I started medical school when I was 54. I graduated in 2016. And I had only been out of medical school for about six months. And I went to England to study mediumship because I was still doubting that you could bring in a spirit for somebody else and communicate with that spirit, identify who it is, and then bring a message to that person. So I went there, even though I had received all the messages, but that's different because somebody's dropping in on me. Sometimes I know who it is. Sometimes it's a spirit guide. But could you actually do that for somebody else? So I went there very skeptic and I wanted proof again, of course, because I'm such a scientist at heart. 
So I go there and I arrive a day early and I sit in this hotel room for a whole day because I'm trying to get adjusted to, to their time zone in England. And my mother had passed away when I was in med school during my first year. She was 87 and she had dementia during those last years. And here I am six months out of med school and I'm thinking, oh my gosh, I'm going to get dementia just like my mom. Uh, and now I'm not in medical school. My brain is just going to turn to mush and I need to stimulate it. So I watched this show called Brain Games, literally for six hours. And I'm sitting there watching Brain Games. And then I go to this college and I have a read, my first like professional reading with one of the teachers at the school. And she didn't know anything about me. People come from all over the world to study there. So there's you know, we represent the entire world in, in that big class. And she says, I have your mother with me. And the first thing she says is, your mother tells me you're writing a book. And she says, you're to write two books. No, wait, three. So right there, right away, I knew. And then she had all these expressions that, that my, only my mom would use. And then she says, my, your mother is telling me that you're worried about getting dementia. And that you're watching these shows, brain games, something about the brain to keep the brain active. How would she know that? Nobody knew that. I was by myself in a hotel room somewhere in England. And then she says, your mother says, you don't have to worry about getting dementia because you are going to die from something else. So what does that tell you? Here we go through life and we worry about all the diseases that our parents had and we spend so much time worrying about it instead of just enjoying life. Maybe I'm going to die from a bee sting while I'm eating dinner in a restaurant. But then I walk around worrying that I'm going to get dementia because my mom had it. So that's just very comforting. And it also shows how divine our existence is and how interconnected we are. There is no death. There is only continuation of life. Your soul continues to exist on the other side without your body. And we can communicate with the spirit world and get messages about our current life or about their life. There is no death. Only death of the physical body. We were all born with these intuitive gifts. You all have intuitive gifts. We are intuitive spiritual creatures. And when we talk about healing, healing in, in intuition and spirituality, we need to heal the physical, but we also have to integrate the emotional and the spiritual. And we need to connect with that inner light, healing and divine guidance. And we need to connect with all of it in order to create true healing. Some people have a spontaneous healing. However, that is not the norm. We know that. Some people just all of a sudden they heal. And spiritual people sometimes I come across, they tend to think that, oh, I'm spiritual so I can heal myself. But the truth is that once something has manifested into the physical, we need to work on the physical. But then we need to also work on the emotional and the spiritual because we have to work on all of it. And we're also dealing with the inherited trauma that we inherit spiritually through the invisible grid of the interconnectedness of everything that is. As well as dealing with the inherited DNA, both physically and emotional trauma that can that inher gets inherited through the physical DNA. And we can't always heal the physical. Sometimes we just have to live with it and taking a medication. Um, but we can often manage our conditions, you know, by taking a, a medication for the rest of our life and we go on. And that's okay. And sometimes that's just how it is. And once we have a problem, once we have a physical problem, emotional problem, all we can really do is, is work at it but we need to incorporate the whole. So 
when we think about it, sometimes I hear people say, well, you know, my aunt gave herself cancer. Well, it, it's true that our thoughts impact our physical, our physical existence, but we tend to forget that babies are also born with tumors. Some of the diseases that we have later, that manifest later in life, we were born with that. Maybe we incarnated to have that, that experience. And most diseases can't be cured by yoga and celery juice, even if it did work for someone. Life is just much more complex than this. And it really takes a village to create healing for someone. And we need to restructure our Western approach and the way we view our healing. If you look at the indigenous cultures, you know, and we look at a shaman, they, they incorporate so many different modalities of healing. He doesn't just beat on his drum and say, okay, you're healed. He sits, he or she sits with the person, they hold their hands, they sing to them, they give them plant medicine, they do, they use takuma needles, they do journeying, cord cutting ceremonies, all these different types of spiritual ceremonies and as well as healing the emotional and the physical with plant medicine. So they really incorporate a bigger toolbox. And it's interesting because in some ways, the indigenous cultures that still exist on our earth today know more about how to heal someone than we do in the Western world. Of course, we have come to great advancements. And if you have a heart attack, I'm going to go to the ER if I have a heart attack, because we're really good at saving people's life in a very, very acute situation. But when it comes to healing chronic kind of diseases, where the Western medicine is not so good, and we need to change that approach in how we create healing for these people. And we need to work as a team and we need to talk to each other, each of the different specialties within medicine itself. We have doctors and nurses and counselors, psychiatrists, psychologists, and everybody does their own little piece, but we don't all communicate with each other to create a healing for this person. And it really takes a village. So ask yourselves, is it ethical to practice medicine or work as a healer without incorporating intuition and spirituality in the work as a healer. So thank you all for listening. It's been my pleasure to be part of your special day in New Zealand. I'm looking forward to the question and answer sessions later and feel free to ask me anything. I will do my best to answer all your questions. And I also want to announce that I just started a new podcast series. It's called Dr. Lottie science with soul. And it's my hope that you will gain information from this podcast to help create a path of healing emotionally, spiritually, and physically in your own life and create a bridge between science and soul. And it's available on all major platforms, iTunes, Spotify, it should be available in New Zealand. If you can't find it for any reason, then just send me an email. And to work with me or to learn more about me, go to drlaudie.com or Divine Spiritual Essence. The websites are linked. Um, I do readings for people. I do medium readings that brings in spirits from the spirit world um, to communicate or leave messages with the person. Uh, I also do psychic readings and shamanic work as well. I also work on ancestral healing. And uh, I also teach classes in mediumship development and uh, different kinds of shamanic things um, like meeting your spirit animals or meeting your spirit guides. So you can find more information on that at drlotta.com or Divine Spiritual Essence. Uh, also, you can follow me on Facebook and Instagram under Dr. Lottie Valentine. No E on the Valentine part because it's the Swedish spelling of Valentine. And again, thank you everyone for listening. And I'm looking forward to meeting you all during the questions and answers.
I hope you enjoyed listening to this episode of Dr. Lottie, Science with Soul. Make sure you are subscribed so you will be notified of new episodes as they become available. To book a session with me or to sign up for a workshop or to see me as a physician, please visit drlottie.com or divinespiritualessence.com. My book, Med School After Menopause, The Journey of My Soul, is available online at Amazon as well as other online platforms worldwide. 